Good morning and welcome to a special edition to, of FAU's Research in Action. It is my very great pleasure to uh, welcome you to a special treat this morning. My name is Karen Scapinado. I will be your moderator this morning. With that, it is my very great pleasure for the special treat we have for you today. We will, as part of this uh, presentation, live stream to uh, Sicily, Italy, where Brian McConnell will join us in a few moments here. Dr. McConnell is a uh, professor in art history and classical archaeology here at FAU. He has conducted uh, archaeological field research for the past three decades or so and is also leading FAU's summer research abroad uh, excavation program in ancient Palique or Rocchicella di Mineo. With that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. McConnell and he can tell you live what it looks like to be an archaeological dig. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, everybody. We're here in eastern Sicily uh, in the Margi River Valley um, at the archaeological site of Rocchicella di Mineo. In antiquity, this was uh, the most important sanctuary of the island's indigenous sickle peoples. The sickles are known uh, from ancient Greek historians like Thucydides, who wrote in the fifth century BC, um, and they were an important to the story of the rise of civilization on this island in the center of the Mediterranean. Let me just flip the screen so that you can take a look at the Margie River Valley. Um, here it is. Um, it's a gray day today, but um, a, there's a certain quality um, and you can see the uh, green grass of the spring um, as I pan across the valley here. We'll pan a little bit more and then um, if you look in the distance, um, you can see some buildings and trees. That's the location of the site of the so-called boiling lakes, which you're going to hear about. The site itself was an important feature on the landscape for its water resources. Even today, this hill is a source of pure spring water that comes from its permeable uh, volcanic rock. We're standing along a canal um, that was cut sometime in the sixth century BCE. The canal gathered water from the rock and from ground runoff and brought it to places where it could be used for a variety of purposes. The dramatic cutting in the rock, which you can see over here as the canal goes around a corner, um, is some of the best hydraulic engineering that one can find anywhere on the island, even among its famed coastal cities. Now, um, what I'm, we're going to do is to give you a little bit of a wider context uh, of the site um, in our first video. Rocicella di Mineo lies literally along the fault line where the African and the European tectonic plates meet. The interface between these plates produces a variety of volcanic activity, including the creation of the majestic Mount Etna, Europe's largest active volcano, which you will see in the background. The Rocicella Hill itself is a volcanic formation from magma that emerged between cracks in geological folds at a time when the land was actually under the sea. After the land was pushed up above sea level, the wave shaped the hill and carved out a large grotto on its southern side. Out on the plain below the grotto, Continuing geological interaction created a pocket of carbon dioxide, which emerged from the ground to form what were known in antiquity as the boiling lakes. You see this area coming into view in the lower portion of the screen. Today, the carbon dioxide is extracted for industrial purposes. The ancient historian Diodorus Siculus, who wrote in the first century BCE, described geysers that shot up from the lakes, which were loud and rose to great heights in the air. Greek and Roman mythology tells us that they heralded the presence of two divine boys, the Palikoi, who were sons of a nymph named Thalia and the god Zeus. Thalia, who feared the anger of Zeus's wife, the goddess Hera, hid her sons under the earth, and like Persephone, whom Greek myth says was taken under the earth by Hades just two valleys to the west, the Palikoi too would return to the surface periodically. The boiling lakes were thought to be an oracle that could express judgment for capital crimes, and they became the focus of a cult that lasted for at least seven centuries, from the Greek archaic period through the rise of the Roman Empire. 
Rocicelli di Mineo also served in the 5th century BCE as the center of a short-lived league of sickle cities under the leadership of a man named Ducerius, and it seems to have maintained its special identity as a cult center even when Sicily came under Roman rule. The archaeological site is articulated into several areas, including the slope below the large grotto, the summit, where there was an archaic temple, and an upper plateau just below the summit, where we know there was a fortified settlement of the 4th century BCE and likely an earlier urban layout as well. Archaeological excavation at the site has been underway since the early 1960s, but substantial work and the creation of an archaeological park began in the mid-1990s, and today the site is a protected area of the Sicilian regional government. Okay, so you've had a, an introduction to the area. I'm here um, together with Dottoressa Laura Maniscalco, Director Emerita of the Sopradenza per i Beni Culturali ed Ambientali di Catania. Um, she's the one who created this park. The current director of the uh, park, Dottoressa Gioconda Lamagna, unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but she did record a greeting for you. The greeting is in Italian, but there is a translation which will be running on the right side of the screen. So this is our second video. ...e di presentarmi. Io sono Gioconda Lamagna, sono il direttore del Parco Archeologico di Catania e della Valle dell'Aci. È un parco molto grande che contiene al suo interno non solo i monumenti e le aree archeologiche di Catania che sono importantissimi, il teatro antico, l'anfiteatro, le terme della Rotonda, ma anche eh, monumenti del barocco catanese, parlo della chiesa di San Francesco Borgia, e musei, la Casa Verga, il Museo di Adrano, il Museo di Centurbe, il Museo della Ceramica di Caltagirone, eh, sparse in tutta la provincia. Quindi eh, un parco grandissimo, dalle emergenze eh, non solo archeologiche ma culturali, paesaggistiche ed architettoniche, e eh, all'interno di questo parco, dicevo, c'è il, il Museo della Ceramica di Caltagirone e c'è l'area archeologica di Palichè, che è un'area bellissima, che è, è stata sottratta in passato agli appetiti di una zona industriale che eh, voleva diciamo, sfruttarla anche per, ehm, perché era vicino alla, ai laghetti di Naftia, che era preda dei tombaroli e che la sovrintendenza a partire dagli anni 90 è riuscita a conquistare con una eh, campagna di espropri e che adesso dopo anni e anni di ricerche archeologiche capillari eh, è pienamente fruibile e pienamente conosciuta. Conosciuta ovviamente soltanto per quello che si è potuto fare perché è un'area talmente vasta eh, per la quale io sono sicura eh, la ricerca archeologica continuerà sicuramente a, a riservarci delle bellissime sorprese e quindi io invito tutti a venire a vedere quest'area, a collaborare, a scavare anche con eh, la nostra supervisione e, e appunto vi saluto e vi aspetto. Grazie. As I said before, I'm here with Dottoressa Laura Maniscalco, um, who now uh, will tell you a little bit about the creation of the park. Good morning. The site of Rocchicella has been mm -hmm. identified as the site of the ancient Palicoi sanctuary since the 16th century, thanks to the Dominican monk Tommaso Fasello, who just uh, using the book of Diodoro Siculus and uh, on horseback, he literally covered uh, hundreds of kilometers to Sicily uh, and was able to identify the Selinus, for example, and this place also. Extensive excavation begin here in 1995. I'm proud to be that I begin this excavation. And uh, uh, we were able, uh, thanks uh, also to funding from European community, to make the uh, excavation in large area. And uh, the research now go ahead thanks to the effort of Florida Atlantic University. But thanks to European community funding, it was also possible to restore the 18th century 
farmhouse that now is used as an antiquarium and uh, storage place and facilities for restoration. But this is not only archaeology. This park is a, a beautiful uh, place of natural history. So we can see birds. Uh, we have a family of falcon living right uh, on the grotto. Uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, several uh, species of uh, flower and plant, for example, um, wild orchids. And so this is place is so beautiful, not only for archaeologists, but also for the nature. It's a quiet place where you at least can stay far from noise and automobile. <laughs> so it's, it's a very, it's a pleasure to work and to be here. I'm going to take a brief moment to diverge from the script and just show you the valley once again, because the sun has come out just in our honor. And you can see really just how dramatic it is. You can also see the farmhouse down in the field that Dr. Samaniscalco told you about. It is now the administrative center, the antiquarium or exposition space and storage and laboratory center for uh, all of the work that goes on here. What we're going to do next is to visit some of the monumental buildings at the site. Our third video is going to be an introduction to what those buildings were. The ancient historian Diodorus Siculus describes the site in fair detail. He says explicitly that it was embellished with stoai and every kind of lounging place. A stoa is a multi-purpose building that took shape in the Greek world. It had a series of rooms set side by side that opened out onto a long corridor with an open colonnade on the exterior. It took several years to excavate Stoa B. Here we see an early view of the excavation. Here, more of the building has been revealed. And here we see the full remains of the building after they have been brought to light. This slide shows a preliminary reconstruction of what the building would have looked like with ceramic elements of its roof. Often the rooms of a stoa were used for shops, but also for sacred activities, such as we find here with a table, perhaps for sacrifices to heavenly divinities, and a bothros, or sacred pit where liquid offerings could be made to underground divinities like the divine Palikoi. This reconstruction shows a man pouring a sacrificial offering called a libation and a woman with a sacrificial piglet. The Hestiaterion is likely what Diodorus Siculus referred to as a lounging place, and it is a relatively rare architectural form with Greek style dining rooms set around a central court or foyer. This is a view of the Hestiaterion when it had just been excavated. This is an early digital reconstruction of the building. The Hestiaterion had a monumental facade with four columns through which people could enter the foyer. Four larger dining rooms and three smaller rooms opened off the foyer. The Hestiaterion was built at the top of a series of terraces and it was likely a place for sacred meals as one can discern in the various ancient references to rituals at Palike, but it also may have served, at least briefly, as a meeting hall for the Sickle League, where representatives from the Sickle settlements around the Margi Valley could hold power lunches. People would dine in the Hestiaterion, not by sitting at a table, as we do today, but by stretching out on dining couches, with the upper body propped up on one arm. Food and drink would be placed in front of the couch on tables that a person could reach with the other arm. The layering of structures in this area is complex, and it shows the first monumental layout of the 7th century BCE, which follows the natural slope below the grotto. We can see this in the upper left-hand portion of the slide in light blue. The later transformation in the 5th century BCE, perhaps connected with the rise of the Sickle League, can be seen in darker blue in the same upper left-hand diagram and also in a schematic arrangement in the right side of the screen. 
Here we see a more regular grid-like arrangement of buildings that was even an axis with the boiling lakes and the ancient city of Menai, far on the other side of the Marja River Valley. We see that in the lower left-hand portion of the image. Uh, we're looking along the axis towards the boiling lakes and far on the other side of the valley is the hill where the ancient city of Menai, today Meneo, is located. This was the hometown of the sickle leader, Ducetius. So we are, uh, let's see uh, if we can get the video to, for us to go ahead. Um, we are inside the area of the Hestiatarian here. Mm -hmm. I see that the uh, um, video is actually working. Um, the Hestiatarian is pre uh, protected by this big metal shed that you can see up above. Um, it was at the top of a hill uh, which was accessed by means of a road. Let me just flip the image here so that you can uh, see. Let me just, uh, it comes, it leads to a road where I'm standing right now. And I'm going to pan around the structure just like this very slowly to show you where that road actually went. Um, it went to a stairway that you can see um, which is cut into the side of the hill that actually led all the way to another sanctuary at the top of the hill. That's a whole nother complex uh, part of the site um, I, that, is, uh, that we have been uh, excavating as well. The Hesiotarian was indeed a monumental building and uh, it had monumental cut blocks like the ones that you see for the entranceway. Um, the full set of blocks in the lower course of the entranceway is preserved here. And there are blocks that go down four courses below this to provide a very solid foundation for the building. A second step was built on top of that. And although most of the blocks are no longer here, you can see from the cuttings uh, in the blocks, these so-called setting lines, um, where the other blocks could have been. So uh, we're able to reconstruct uh, what that building was like. Um, the precision of the blocks here is as good as what you can find in any Greek center, including the Agora of Athens. This is my favorite block here, um, where you can see uh, the anatherosis, which was a technique where you see that center area cut away um, that the Greeks used and the, the sickles perhaps used here too, um, to uh, put the blocks together very neatly. Down below, you can see uh, a pry hole, and there's even an area where uh, the cutting went a little too far. So that tells us something about how they cut the blocks. Uh, along the side, uh, you can see these decorative bands, uh, which uh, we found years ago uh, in an excavation when I was a student uh, on the painted stoa in the Agora of Athens. My favorite view is right here. Well, let's go the other way. Um, so uh, you can see how the lip of the block to the left fits perfectly on the block to the right along the setting line there. And there's even a little fragment of the block that uh, was once there, um, which we found in place and has been held there by plaster um, right there. Now, this building was used, we know, for uh, ritual dining and perhaps political dining. I'm going to walk very slowly through the structure um, so that you can see one of the dining rooms. There are many other later features of this building, so um, some of the blocks that you see weren't part of its original construction. Let's look down here at the entranceway. You can see these blocks, um, which uh, have some of the features that we saw before, but there's a big cutting for a step um, that's set into it. I'm going to turn to the next block. Um, the rear portion uh, of that block is missing, but we know that it was there. Um, this doorway was set off center with respect to the rooms because uh, there would be dining couches that were set around the edges. Along this side over here, uh, by the doorway, a couch would be set lengthwise and they would go all the way around the room to the other side where the couch would come in uh, as a header, not as a stretcher. And for that reason, the doorway was off center. One of the interesting things that we found uh, was this big block that you see there, it has a kind of T section. 
this could have been one of the bases for the dining couches. And um, it could have been the part that held the platform where the person would have stretched out uh, was, or it could have been the platform itself that would have been set on its side. We're not really sure. This is a unique piece um, uh, found in the Mediterranean. Um, in the back area over here, where you can see uh, another dining room and then three smaller rooms over there, uh, you get a sense for how the building was put together. After uh, the height of the Roman Empire, surely, and by the fourth century uh, AD, when, uh, for example, the famous villa at Piazza Marina um, was uh, in use, this area was turned into a farm and some of the room you see inside the room uh, date to that time. Uh, after that, uh, the, when the full structure was actually buried, there was a church that was built on its western side. You can see uh, that over here, that stone wall, which is in the highest portion uh, that remains unexcavated over there is actually the foundation for a church which had a little apse, which was close uh, to the rock on the other side. Uh, so there are many things uh, to see uh, over here. Um, our work at FAU has concentrated instead on the area where just below where Dr. Samaniscalco is standing right now. Um, our students have been looking at the venerable old structures, trying to get the chronology of the earlier structures that preceded the construction of the Hestiatarian and the Stoas down below. In the next video, you're going to see some of those students at work. Archaeological excavation is a careful dissection of stratigraphic layers, many of which represent successive floor levels. At the middle portion of the slope, they were the most venerable archaic buildings. Excavation is a slow process, and care must be given to finding and including ceramics, bones, lithics, and soil samples about the environment. so that you can see uh, this. I'm going to turn this so that you can see where we have been. Look up there, that's where the Hestiatarian is. You can see the edge of the grotto on the top and uh, uh, the stairs also lead uh, from there. In this area, we have a whole series of cuttings which are important to our understanding of the architecture of the place. Let's turn around and you can see some of these cuttings right here. My job has been to study the monumental architecture, how the buildings went together, and uh, how to uh, actually reconstruct them. And so we do things like this. We look at the cutting that you can see down over here. This is actually the earlier one. Um, and uh, later on, they cut a deeper cutting to realign the building that you can see here. A little bit of that realignment um, uh, is also visible in the area sort of propped up in a, in a rough way um, of this construction, which changed the angle of the building when they made it bigger and better. There are other cuttings up here that are useful for uh, understanding how water was managed. Remember, water is very, very important uh, at this site. And it's one of the reasons that the place was here. Um, here you can see a channel that comes down from the upper side. There actually was a Okay, here's another cutting, which uh, was probably made uh, in order to first take water away from behind the Stoa B, and also for a later construction um, that was built on top of everything else that went up five meters on its lower side. Um, Stoa B itself is a very impressive structure. Dr. Resumaniscalco is walking into it now. 
Um, I'm going to walk ahead just so you can see a little bit more of what's in there. I hope that we will keep our connection. We've put down gravel on the site in order to slow down the growth, not impede fully, but to slow down the growth of plants. Um, here inside uh, the stoa, you can see its length. It was a multi-purpose building with many, many rooms. Um, the area towards the center had a table called a trapeze and a bothros, which was a sacred pit for uh, making offerings. Um, and you'll see some of the materials that uh, were found in there in our next video, where Dr. Samani Scalco takes you through to see some of the things in the antiquarium. We are inside the antiquarium, which is the museum at the site. The files that we recovered during the years of excavation are put on display here. The antiquarium is uh, important to our visitors and group students. Uh, we had uh, thousands of students uh, that participated uh, in our uh, educational program over the years. Our excavations have discovered uh, archaeological layers that run from prehistory to medieval time, a very wide chronological phases that cover millennium. As we can see in this chart, the history of the place is very long and complex, and it embraces the period before the sanctuary, the time of the sanctuary, and the time when the sanctuary was not anymore in existence, but the place became part of a large agricultural estate, and later a Byzantine settlement. The exhibition cases present in a chronological order just a selection of the many, many finds that we recovered from our excavation, mostly from the area of the Grotto. is it is common in archaeological excavation. Most of the finds are pottery, and pottery is very important for us archaeologists because from pottery we can derive a lot of information. Pottery is an important element for dating archaeological strata because the shape and decoration of pottery vessels change over the years. The possible time span is much wider when we have less knowledge of a particular period of antiquity. So, for example, we can date this coverage vessels within a range of several hundred years inside the fourth millennium BC. Why we can date a cup of the classical age with a margin of error of just a decade. Important aspect of ceramics include the, fu the function of the vessels. If the vessel was used for storage or to drink or pour from, the technology with which it was made, that is, if it was molded by hand or with the help of a pottery wheel, whatever it was fired in an open pit at a relatively low temperature, or in a closed kiln of a high temperature, or whatever it was locally made or imported from somewhere else. During excavation, we archaeologists collect not only artifacts, but also what we call ecofacts, such as seeds, charcoal, animal bones, like those that are from those primigenous and came from epipaleolithic strata. All those bones, seeds, and charcoal provide the important data for the reconstruction of the environment and climate in antiquity, and also for the economy and people's diet. In this case, we see architectural terracottas, uh, ceramic pieces that were created as a kind of skin that would protect the wooden roof of the monumental buildings. Um, from various small pieces of large uh, elements, such as this calipter that you see over here, or this cover tile, uh, over there that would have covered the joints between two pan tiles or the painted eaves tiles with their lovely decoration that you can see uh, over there, we're able to get a full sense of what the roofs of the buildings were like. We also get a sense for the production and things that would happen along the way. The fragments, the tile fragments that you see over there actually have the prints of a cat 
or feline, um, which happened to walk through the tiles uh, as they were being produced. All lamps were placed on a table, a trapeza in ancient Greek, while pumps and pots were aligned along the back wall, perhaps on wooden shelves of which no trace remains. Those pots were made of high resistant refractory clay. They were called cutrae, which generally were used for the preparation of sap, soups, or the boiling of vegetables, legumes, and meats, and lopades, which were long castle like dishes with lids that were used perhaps for the preparation of sauce. Inside the boltros or offering pit, we found goat and sheep bones that have been burned, probably in sacrifice, and black plated scufoi, which were cups from Africa, which likely had been broken originally after pulling out their liquids. side of a wooden tablet. The flat side was used to erasing the errors by scrapping away the character in the wax. Here we see terracotta figurines that were made in a mold, also in terracotta. The molds document the presence of craft shops that probably produced objects for the sanctuary. Now we are going to see another video which takes place uh, actually out in the field down below which you can see uh, out there Whoop. Uh, out there um, two specialists in geophysical surveying uh, will tell you what they do this is our sixth video exploration is not simply the physical excavation of ancient structures and the recovery conservation and display of objects but a variety of techniques such as those of remote sensing, can help us know what else there is to find even before our digging tools touch the ground. Here we see an infrared photograph taken from an aircraft by the company Aerosistemi for the Sorprendenza in the year 2000. It suggests that there are many anomalies in the area outside the formal limits of the park that are worth investigation. In order to get a closer look, and thanks to a seed grant, from the Dorothy F. Schmidt, Carl Bruce Bevan, and Professor Tatiana Smakalova spent a week at the site measuring the magnetic properties of the soil and the materials that it contains. Here they explain. So this is a, what's called a magnetic susceptibility meter. It's now off, but I can turn it on right here, and it should normally read zero, and it is reading zero there, pretty close to zero. But when I go over to, uh, say, a ceramic like this, this ceramic here will touch this sensor to it. You see, go way over the top of the scale there. See how that needle goes way up there? It means that's very magnetic. I'll increase the scale of the, uh, decrease the sensitivity so it won't go up so high. It still goes way up there. But extremely magnetic, that bit of ceramic. For some reason, it's much more ceramic, much more magnetic than most of the stone here. So this is measuring what is called the magnetic susceptibility of materials ceramic and stone and um, it's a very good way to quantify how they differ I'm 
now of analyzing these measurements, but the results from the survey will be used to determine what we do next in that field in the coming years. So you see research in action right there. So this has been your introduction to the site. We've taken you around to see some of the buildings. There are many, many more things to see. Um, we've showed you the antiquarium and some of the things that are on display. Um, perhaps you have questions now. Great, thank you so much, Brian. We do have time for questions. Brian, um, excavations in archaeology take a lot of patience from, you know, you showed that video with the, uh, with the students uh, going through basically dirt and looking for scraps. Um, uh, how did you get into archaeology and excavation? I was always interested in archaeology, and actually in high school, I went to a dig um, at Campsville, Illinois, uh, along the Illinois River. I, I, in college, uh, I worked as a, an archaeologist assistant with a contract surveying team in New York City. When I was a freshman in uh, college, um, by almost by chance, I ended up in a course on Aegean Bronze Age prehistory which is rather rare, but that fired my imagination. And although I had the idea that I might do mathematics, chemistry, or something else like that, which are all wonderful subjects, all of a sudden, literally, the, the light went off and there was a ray from heaven that came down and said, no, archeology span is the thing that you should do. So uh, both of my degrees, my undergraduate and my graduate degree are in classical archeology. span And I've worked in a number of places, including Greece, Turkey, Cyprus, but for the past over 30 years, uh, here in Sicily. I like seeing landscapes and seeing things that uh, once were that aren't there anymore but are still there. There's the excitement. It's, it, when you do a dig, it, for me, it's almost like a sports match because the land doesn't want to give up its secrets, but I want to find them out. And so uh, my job is to play that game. There are many analogies that you can make with, with digging. One is almost like, like steering a ship in the middle of the sea. There's a lot of quiet time, there's a lot of patience, and then all of a sudden things happen. Um, and so that's the spirit. I like being out using my hand. We're having a lot of wind background, Brian, at the moment. <laughs> um, it, it's also almost like a, a, a time machine, right? You're almost going back in time and, and learning how ancient uh, cultures have lived. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, we, we may think we know a lot about uh, them, but uh, every generation sees new things. So, you know, I consider it a privilege to be working now, but who knows what it'll be like in the future. Okay. So other people should join the field. Um, now, you've shown us the excavation of the Hestiaterion. Uh, how long did that take to excavate? Uh, something like five years. Um, it's not fully excavated. You never want to excavate something fully because you might find other things. We put a few trenches down uh, by that foundation, uh, by that entrance area, um, to get some materials out of the foundation trench. We got 10 pieces which date the building to the middle of the 5th century BC. Um, but there is much more to do. Generally, that structure took about uh, five years. And it took really the funds of the European community and professional workmen with 30 years of experience uh, to do some of the work on that. You still have a bit of a, a wind background, Brian. It's sometimes a little hard. Let to... me walk to uh, a covered area where, which is why. Uh, 
So here's the next question, Ryan. Um, so uh, would you um, uh, say that the Oracle site that you are excavated is isolated or is it part of an ancient city and do you imagine unearthing uh, additional buildings? Okay, um, I, this is a, a, a rural site. Um, the places where the sickles lived were around the valley. Let me flip the screens so you can once again see where we are. The whole valley has um, I, hills around it and all of those hills were inhabited. So the actual cities or towns that uh, were immediately in the area were out there. This was a central place. We think it might be a market. We think it might have, oh, it was, certainly was a cult, a cult center, um, but the cities themselves were in the area around here. Now, Diodorus Siculus, that historian, he says that uh, Ducadius measured out the land uh, in the fifth century BC. So maybe there are surprises that we'll find uh, right out in the fields below. But um, I think that the organization of this area was uh, a little bit different than what you would find near a Greek city at the coast. Very interesting. Can you remind us where in Sicily you are? We're in the southeastern area. If you were to drive from the city of Catania to Jela, Catania is on the eastern coast and Jela is on the southeastern coast, you would probably come through this valley on the highway that leads there via the city of Caltagirone. Um, Caltagirone is down at the end of the valley. Um, I'll show it to you here, way down there in the center of the screen. Um, uh, and you pass by that uh, area on the way to uh, Jela. It's a very interesting thing that uh, my advisor for graduate school, Ross Holloway, who was a um, specialist in, uh, in Sicily, wrote a fantastic article many years ago, and he took the ancient historian Thucydides. <clears throat> and in Thucydides' book, um, this fifth century BC, he talks about ambassadors from the Athenians who were trying to get support for the Athens and the Peloponnesian War. They would pass from one side of Sicily to the other through sickle territory. And he took all of those references and plotted them out on the map, and he got this area. This is where they, where they were. So that's further confirmation of uh, the story. And it's, it's really very exciting uh, to hear about that and to you know, see it in its landscape reality. Speaking of the sickle population, how large was that native population? Do you have an estimate, uh, estimate for that? Well, uh, I won't give a number because it would it would be sort of a sort of a guess. Some people uh, think that the Greek city of Syracuse was 200,000. How many of those people were sickles or had sickle background? Um, these hills uh, in the first millennium BC were all occupied. And this is true in the eastern portion of the island, the central portion of the island, and the western portion of the island. Um, the Greeks used the term sickle. And in Thucydides, we hear of sickles in the east, sickens in the west, and elimi in the northwest around the city of Suggested. These are the three names that we use. Is there an effective difference between a sickle and a sicken? Um, I, I think that means indigenous person from a geographical area. I think there's more geographical sense than an ethnic sense. Um, Ilimi may be different. There is a different language there. We don't know, uh, exactly. we can't read sickle. We don't have enough of it to read it, but we do know that it was related to Latin. Um, and so, uh, say, Ducetius, uh, you know, that sounds an awful lot like Latin dux, which means leader. And so Ducetius, was that his real name or was that his job, his role? Was he the leader? Um, the palikoi, I think, actually comes from uh, pal, which is a, etymologically refers to gray things, uh, you know, or um, a, uh, or uh, the mud that was around uh, the actual lakes themselves. So that may be the etymology of the name. Very interesting. I had a lot of Latin in school, so this is all very interesting to me. Um, uh, another question related to where you are, Brian, what are the squared caves that we can see behind you on the hillside? Okay, let me flip this. My battery is going 
uh, a little bit low over here, but we're going to see what we can do. The caves are actually tombs. Uh, I'm going to turn up and you can see some of the tombs. The date of these tombs is to the late Bronze Age or early Iron Age. Uh, cutting tombs in rocks, uh, in the rock, uh, is a very long, very old prehistoric tradition here. So you, you're looking at uh, uh, these tombs that are up there that actually had walkways in front of them, that were, where the rock comes down, it's uh, where one could walk. Um, so you mentioned the students and we saw the students um, seeing excavating. Are you planning on uh, having students over again this year? I guess that's a little bit depending on the uh, COVID situation. The COVID situation determines it. We would love to have students this summer, but we have to be sure that everyone's safe and that we can uh, work in safe conditions. But as soon as we can, believe me, um, <laughs> the announcement will be there. So look for it. Yeah. Um, can non-academic groups come to this side? It is my understanding that this is a, a park that's open to the public, correct? It's open to the public, yes. And um, right now, like most museums and archaeological sites in Italy, it's closed due to COVID. Um, but it is open uh, Tuesday through Saturday and Wednesdays. It's open all day through 6 p.m. Um, and it's taken care of by uh, the people that uh, you see here. Let me just introduce you uh, to the people who take care of the site. Let me uh, turn this so that you, you can see all of them. They can say hi to you. There's Mr. Jerry, there's Mr. Gretzioso, there's Mr. Bonilla, and the other people, Mr. Maniscalco. And they give you your visit them and they'll, they'll give you a nice little uh, introduction to the place as well. I know about uh, anybody else, but I'm going to make my way over there after COVID. Um, uh, I, I, a question closer to home here in, in Florida, where we are, are there any places that you know of in Florida that uh, are uh, archaeological digs? Oh, there are many, uh, there are many archaeological sites. Uh, Palm Beach County has an official archaeologist. My favorite place is actually Mound Key over on the other side of uh, Florida near Bonita Springs. Um, there you have, uh, it's almost like the Venice of the Calusa world. The that's kind of an island. And there are many things to, to see there. So yes, Florida has a lot of archaeology, absolutely. Coming back to the excavation, and, and uh, we saw a lot of uh, amazingly preserved ceramics in your museum there. Do those uh, uh, come all from the site there? Yes, the ones that you saw in the particular group all came from that Bothros. They enabled us to know what uh, you know was going on there. You actually have the ritual of uh, pouring liquids to underground divinities, maybe the Palikoi, and then the ritual breaking and deposition of the ceramics. That's pretty amazing. And those are very, very good uh, you know, ceramics too. Yes, very high do. quality. Very well preserved. Um, one of the questions of one of our attendees is whether you've act, uh, ever worked really hard to excavate something and then right as you're about to get it, it broke uh, uh, in your hands. Um, well, that happens, but we try to be careful. You want to take a, a find out with some of the earth with it. Um, you know, inevitably there are, are, are little nicks and, and dings that happen here or there, but restoration, that's what restoration is all about. And there's some very, very uh, talented restorers here. Um, coming back to the landscape there, you mentioned that some of the caves behind you are tombs. That big cave behind the Hestator, Hestiatorian, is that used for anything? Um, we don't really know because the roof has fallen in on it. Um, we know that there were Paleolithic finds in the levels out there. Um, uh, it's very hard to get, to get in. In classical times, the Hestiatorian is the uh, uppermost level of the terrace. I don't think they use the cave for, uh, for much. Water came out of the side, um, but, uh, and there may be very, very early remains underneath the ceiling of the cave that has fallen down, but those are very, very big blocks. Coming back to the, the items that you've excavated, one of the questions here is, um, what is the most expensive thing and you can, you can uh, judge that however you like uh, that you have excavated. In terms of value, we think in terms of historical value, right. we think in terms of archeological value. Uh, monetary value is simply what somebody wants to pay for something. So any sense for that is, uh, is a function of our times, not times in antiquity. Coming back 
to some history and learning more about the area of Sicily, can you recommend a good history book about Sicily? Um, well, there's uh, Robert Layton's Sicily Before History. I always like the uh, John Julius Norwich uh, books about the medieval uh, times, uh, The Kingdom Under the Sun or Sicily and the Normans. Uh, John Julius Norwich uh, is the author there. Um, there's another book called Syracuse Glory of Sicily, which is very readable. Um, it's not doesn't go into depth like that, but I, I would recommend these books and I can add a bibliography uh, when I answer some of the other questions online. Okay, thank you. Um, an interesting question here. We have somebody calling in from Turkey and um, she's asking uh, whether you have any goals to do similar excavations in Central Asia such as, such as uh, Kazakhstan. Um, it would be very nice. Um, uh, uh, I have been there and uh, I, I think your uh, reader knows that I've been there. Um, I would love to go, to go out there now. Right now, this spring, I'm working on my sabbatical here, but I certainly would love to return to uh, Central Asia to see more. And there's some comparisons that we can make too. The medieval ceramics of Sicily are of that uh, same glaze type that you can find uh, from Turkey all the way through, uh, through Central Asia. So I think there are many projects that could be developed to look at the different qualities of glazes, of firing, of um, uh, the kind of materials that were used. And there's a very big uh, story that could be uh, told there. So yes, um, we would like to extend our, uh, our studies much further. Great, thank you so much, Brian. With that, we're about out of time. Thank you again. I don't know about anybody else, but I will make my way over to Sicily once uh, we're allowed to travel again. And I hope to see okay. you there, Brian. Okay, very good. And once again, let's all uh, say uh, best wishes to everyone. It's been a pleasure hosting you uh, at the site. Okay. Thank Take you care. so much, Brian. Have Take a good day. Okay, bye-bye.